Over the past three hours, you've heard a lot about trends related to the economy, the political environments, and mind-blowing technology. We have asked four senior real estate executives to provide their perspective on these trends, to talk about the implications for their organizations, their strategies, and the impact on the Canadian real estate market in general. To introduce this group of CEOs and to moderate the discussion, we've invited John O'Brien. Since his retirement from CBRE, he has kept himself busy with many things. One is a trustee at CT REIT, and the other the chair of the board at Slate Office REIT. Thank you, John, for returning to the stage. Also, thanks to Home Trust for sponsoring this session. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome John O'Brien. So, um, I now know why nobody else wanted to moderate this panel. <laughs> um, Good start. Yes. <laughs> it, it had no structure to begin with, and, uh, and when I was trying to figure out how we were going to approach this sort of part of the, the program, what hadn't occurred to me was that about a third of the audience at this point would be crossing their legs. The other third would be figuring out that their throat was cut and they wanted something to eat and the last third would be going into a coma <clears throat> because you've been in this room now close to five hours. Um, but what I would say to you is that what, we've, what we're trying to do here is to, to synthesize everything that we heard this morning and put it in a practical sense from four industry leaders, all of whom are innovators, all of whom do not take the status quo and never have taken the status quo. Their, their success has basically been built and being able to move, to be nimble, to take good ideas. And so we thought that this would be the perfect panel in order to sort of look at both sides. This is a very traditional start that we had, and, and that's, I'll start at the, at the start. And then the back half of this time is to actually look then at the, the sort of innovation, this change, uh, a lot of the session that George just moderated, which was incredibly thought-provoking um, and not a little intimidating, actually to be honest. But let me start um, at, a, at a very boring place. I, I mentioned, John went over to me this morning and said sort of, what's the first question? And I said, it has to be interest rates only because that dominate, it dominated the first hour and a half. It dominates every discussion that you've ever heard. It dominates our view of value. So we sort of have to talk about interest rates in terms of what we think, but I don't want their prognostication. We just had that by three really smart people, and not these guys aren't smart. Um, but what I'm interested in is how your organizations have adapted to what you've seen coming. I mean, it's not like it's a surprise. Being surprised by interest rates going up is like having a hit and run with a glacier. So. Um, John, let me start with you, because you and I had this discussion over breakfast not that long ago. I said, what preoccupies you? And you said, interest rates are rising, inflation is coming, and I'm making sure that my organization is ready for the change. So what is it that you've been doing? What have you been looking at? What well, actions? For, for, first of all, I, I like the survey. And you know, when we were just speaking over the guys in the scrum, that I, I see that the last question was, you know, <clears throat> how many uh, people were optimistic or were pessimistic? And we commented that, I guess, you know, 60% were more pessimistic and 40% were not listening. Um, I think that the, um, you know, our view on interest rates is, is not one of trying to, to take a call on whether they're rising or not, but rather looking at risk management and trying to control uh, what could be, uh, you know, difficult events. And of course, we, you've heard this morning, uh, you know, uh, David Rosenberg told you that the world's ending. Um, John Manley said, uh, the liberals, don't worry, uh, you know, be happy. Um, and then um, Salim said, everything you know today is going to be different tomorrow. So out of that, you know, you try and synthesize a strategy. Um, and for us and interest rates, it's hedging our risks. And, and so that's some deleveraging, some hedging strategies, um, and just trying to manage uh, volatility out of our interest rate exposure. And have you gone longer, by, by and large? We've got quite a bit longer. So we've gone a, a longer term, and, and we'll pay a price for that if interest rates go down. Um, and uh, we've extended our maturities from the natural life of the debt is four and a half years or whatever it is, but the interest rate covered life of the debt is more like seven. 
And how would that relate to your sort of weighted average lease term? Are you trying to match those things up and match risk up? We don't focus necessarily on that, but our, our average, uh, our, our, uh, our lease term average and our interest rate average is pretty tight. But it's, it's an imperfect correlation. Um, and, and I think that <laughs> what we've tried to do is, again, you know, try and dampen volatility uh, in our core strategy. So, Brady, um, uh, sorry. Brady, come on up. Yeah, goodness. <laughs> I spent too much time with you guys, Blair. Um, in terms of, you, you've had, a, a, you've aggressively used floating rate debt, and so as this sort of glacier trundles towards us, I, I know you've been looking more and more about how you, how you sort of, uh, yeah, how you approach that, how you fix, when do you fix, do you go too early, and you're giving up spread because you're using that spread to, as a sort of an accretion model inside your, your various businesses. So how have you approached this? Yeah, I think that using financing as your business strategy in real estate is quite dangerous. Um, it's only to enhance your return and provide you with capital. We have used floating rate debt in situations that we think we're gonna add significant value in the underlying asset. So as a result, we would not wanna trap that value in the asset in the fixed rate debt structure if you think you're gonna reset the rent roll or create value. Once the asset's stabilized, I think that you would look to put prudent long-term debt. So I, I think it depends on what you're doing with the asset. I, I think that in today's environment where in, interest rates are, if, if, you, if you didn't have any real estate today and you said, okay, I'm gonna to have to enter into this interest rate market, that's still okay, it's historically cheap, that's, so that's fine. The issue is, is if you have no income growth and you have to reset your debt, I think that's where it's troublesome, and I think that even speaks to the housing market. And are you seeing any reaction from the lenders as you go back to them and you say, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna go this way. Are they accommodating? Is there any pushback? Is, what, what's, on the, I mean, it, you, you, you have to have a counterparty for this whole strategy to work. What are your financial partners saying? Well, first of all, you have to pay them back. That's important. Um, <laughs> So if you pay them back and you have a good strategy, I think that's what's critical. And, and you still have, it's not like you're borrowing 90% financing. You still have a lot of equity in there. So if they believe in your strategy and believe in your team, I think they're there to listen. Um, so I, it really comes down to what asset you're financing and what is the plan and strategy. But there hasn't been significant pushback from lenders if you have the strategy to, and can execute it. And do you find you have those relationship lenders that you have, those are the ones you keep going back to, you're getting this sort of symbiotic relationship that they're more inside your business? Well, so far, until you know the world ends and they don't lend any more money, but yes, so far it's been quite good. And it is all about relationships, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more, but the one thing in the technology part is they never talked about humans and the relationships that we all have and how important that is. And I think that is a critical part of, of how we use technology and relationships going forward. It's kind of fundamental. So Michael, this Michael. My, Michael, the closest to me, Mr. Cooper. You've got a variety of businesses. You're attached to a platform that looks out and, and tries to anticipate what a lot of these these changes are going to look like from the, the financial side. How have you approached it? Is it any different than any other any other cycle you've been through or any other changes? <laughs> okay, so um, this is like nothing ever before um, to start. And I thought it was interesting to the economists because they use a lot of historical data, which I think doesn't really matter too much right now. Um, everything we're seeing and everything they were saying is supportive of having lower debt. And whether that's... Um, because interest rates might go up, or because our businesses are all becoming much more of an operating business, much less like a utility, and much more like something you've got to experiment with. Um, and I think you need real capital to invest in ideas. All of that's consistent with having lesser debt. So I think that's a fundamental change in the industry. As far as interest rates go, I feel like I've wasted a tremendous amount of my life on that, and uh, have had got no benefit from it. So. I think the issue isn't the interest rates like that. The issue is what things are going to happen that's going to make life a lot harder. So the stress test is a way of focusing an interest rate risk on home buyers. Okay, even though interest rates are low, it's not very low if you're trying to buy a house. So you know, fundamentally, it's whether you get disrupted or um, people don't have jobs or people don't have money. Those are the kinds of things I worry about. Interest rates is is, is one thing that could contribute to it, but. As you could hear this morning, it, it is really 
not nearly as significant as we like to talk about. And do you find, again, I'll ask you the same question because I'm interested in the other side of the equation. Do you find lenders as in tune with what you believe is important for the intrinsic value of your real estate as you are? That is not their job. Okay. That's nothing to do with what they do for a living. Um, our bankers are phenomenal and they've been incredibly supportive. But when we think about where our business is going, we like to have the support of our banks. The facts are, we're going to need less debt in the future than we have in the past. And uh, um, I actually think some of the bankers have trouble putting money up. I, I think the market's changed a, a lot. And uh, you know, I, I think one of the big drivers is um, people never save for the long term they way are, the way they are now. I mean, there are trillions of dollars in this country, which is a massive staggering amount between pension funds and individual saving. And uh, you know, that's really affecting uh, the availability of capital, and also it's affecting returns. And I think in a lot of ways, it's really discounting more risky activity. I, th I think the risk premium is coming out of a lot of things. So, so, I mean, we've got a bunch of different changes coming. And, and quite honestly, I think that the banks that, who are incredibly supportive will continue to have great relationships. But um, I think more and more people do what Michael's done, which is have debt under 30% in their business. So you are, you are digging through the magma. At, uh, at the well, you've, you've, you're well on your way to the journey to the center of the earth. I, I notice you've stopped going down, you're starting to come up again now. So in the context of this discussion, not only you know, how did you approach financing for something that big, because th these are fairly, I mean, it's a game-changing type of development, but has this inflation on the construction side? Nice. There you go. Innovation from the <laughs> forum. Yeah. And, I, and I, I guessed what was coming up. Um, but you're, you know, when you look at uh, the rising construction prices, is that something that starts to concern you now as to pro forma seemed to all work for the last four or five years? Everything we pro forma seemed to, to work and, and debt was part of that, not the only part, but was part of it. As you're looking at the well now, is, is pro forma being hit? Are you seeing cost increases that you hadn't anticipated? And on a go forward basis, how is, how is that sort of impacting how you're viewing life? Well, there's no question that construction costs are rising, and they certainly have risen at the well. Fortunately, however, so have the rental rates that we've been able to secure on leasing the first 71% of the office component. I don't think it quite offset the increase in the construction costs, but it did ameliorate it. The last 30%, however, which will be well ahead of internal projection, may get us closer to ameliorating the construction costs. The big question mark for us on this particular uh, project, which I'm very confident in, which probably doesn't surprise you, um, is the rental rates we get on the retail component. And that we won't even be exploring until about 2020, after the office component is fully leased and after the residential components are largely populated, or at least we know who they're going to be populated with. Um, then I think the kind of rental rates we'll be able to attract will, will also help ameliorate uh, the increase in the construction costs. But there's no question that if we look back two years from now and today, our construction costs have probably come in 10 to 15 percent higher than we anticipated. Our lease rates on the office component, and this is the hard part, the pre-leasing part, are also materially higher. So that um, helps. And the two realities are actually correlated. Uh, rents are unlikely to be going up as much as they are in an environment where there isn't a lot of construction and a lot of pressure on construction costs. So the, the two are correlated. If, if you had construction costs going through the roof and rents moderating, it wouldn't correlate very well, but those environments have existed, but fortunately it's not the one we're in. Yeah, and John, you've done a fair bit of sort of retrofit. As you're looking out and you're looking at projects now, are they getting harder to rationalize as the risk curve going up on those projects, or is it just a matter of looking harder and focusing more? Or? I'd like to think we're always innovating, we're always thinking, we're trying to you know, put the customer first. I mean, if you think of a, uh, of a morning like this, 
Um, and here's a challenge for everyone in the room. If you, if, you, if you say to yourself, you spent the morning here, is there one idea that you learned while you're here that you might actually act on? Um, and because if you take that one idea and then you go back to your office and you share it with someone else and see what their idea was, and out of that comes some ideas, and, and really that's, that's what we're trying to do is we look at how we change the nature of our real estate experience. Because the, the, the real estate experience, I think, across every asset class, um, I mean, it started with retail focusing on experience. But I think, you know, we're going to see that in every asset class. And it's, <clears throat> it's ideas that's, that, that, to some degree, come from sessions like this that help inform our strategy as we go forward as, because ultimately, at the end of the day, the the uncertainties that are around us we can't control, but what we can control is can we make a better customer experience and what, is that, what defines that better customer experience? What might our edge be in offering a service to that customer and uh, how do we create value and NOI out of that? And so um, it's just something everybody might be thinking about because when you're here, often there's good ideas to stay on the floor. Don't let them stay on the floor. Take an idea, take something that you can do, not your business, something you can do. Uh, and take that home and think about it. Michael Cooper, you, uh, let's just switch to George's panel now. Um, so <clears throat> we work as a tenant now of yours at Bay Street. What was, when you looked at the business model, when you looked at the covenant, you looked, when you looked at it traditionally, and then you looked at it from a more creative understanding that how the business, business model worked, what were the sort of, what, what drove you to want that tenant in your building, number one? But, more than that, what, is, what sort of intrigued you about what they were doing from close up? I don't know what co-working is there. I don't think there's any. I, I think that what they're doing is they're providing uh, attractive space with incredible flexibility. So it's almost like if McDonald's was going to open in my neighborhood, they came to me and said, we need you to commit to the certain number of hamburgers for the next 10 years. And then they could say, I got a commitment, so now I can get a bank loan. See, that's what we do. We want all our customers to provide us a commitment. We give them to the bank the bank gets happy. We work and said, you know what, you guys do that, we're going to provide as much flexibility as possible, we're gonna get people going from 140, 150 square feet per person to 65 to 75, we're gonna charge three times as much but on a per person basis, it's really only about 25% more. In addition to that, just run your business. And when you need more space, you get more space. When you don't need more space, you can give some back. And uh, what's obvious is our customers love it. John mentioned, I don't know if I'm going to steal your thunder. I'm going to steal your thunder. So oh, yeah. John was saying he thinks it's a great amenity of building. More and more, I think, the idea of having flex space in buildings is going to help you with your other tenants. I think it's a mind changer for us. We're, 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 we put out a press release. 357 Bay is a beautiful old historical building at the corner of Temperance and Bay. We value it at what we think we could trade it at. We're going to put a ton of money in. We're going to put in about 800 bucks. The, the, the roof on top, that was um, an idea, um, but it's not going to be real. Um, <laughs> it's really cool. It's supposed to look a bit like a cloud, like a dream. Um, that's what it was. Uh, and they're going to put a lot of money in. Much like a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> you know what? If you don't have courage, John, you can't get anything done. Yeah. So the idea is they're going to put a ton of money into the building. We're going to put a ton of money into the building. It is going to be off the charts fantastic, which is really easy for us because if we work does great, that's wonderful. They don't do great. We're going to have an exceptional building that we can release in nanoseconds. Um, so, so I think like what I was trying to get at earlier was our businesses are slowly changing to the hotel business where you can't rely on these covenants because as everybody said before, those companies are likely to be gone. You got to be providing your customer with something that they value. And I think what Michael was saying and what we're seeing better than expected with the interest rates going up is our customers are prepared to pay us a lot of money for incremental uh, a customer service, for incremental value for what they're doing. So I think it's actually, I mean, what we're seeing is our rents are going up way more than our interest rate costs. And when we put money into buildings, we make good money on that too. And I think that what we'll see is when you have less debt, and less uh, uh, covenant requirements from your tenants, you're going to do very, very well. And it'll be in, in a way you're going to take more operating risk, which how do you not? We're not utilities anymore, but we're going to be better and better businesses. WeWork's doing incredible things, and I think if people who dismiss them, the thing is SoftBank 
the largest investor in technology in the world thinks WeWork is good. They also, by the way, think parking lots are good. They're, they're going big into parking lots. They're, they're, you know, I wouldn't dismiss them. I, I also think, though, WeWork, is, it's all about the customer service and the client, but it's important that we recognize that that's what our staff wants. And I think for us, we need to create an environment for our people that they feel that it's cool. And, and it's about retaining, winning is about retaining the best people and the most creative people to come on your team. And I think what they've done is now we're like, well, we need to do this for, for our people. And then getting back to technology, 13 years ago, we started our own asset management system. And we have two programmers on staff. And how it started was we need better data and we need to do better analysis off that data. But the weird thing we didn't realize is young people expect to use technology as the tool. If I went into my office and said, here's a pad of paper and a pencil, let's do some long division, they would explode. But if I say, hey, do it on the computer or do it on an app, they're like, yeah, I'll do that for you. And, and so I think that, that it's, it's actually following innovators and following what they do is, is, is as important for your client as for your team as well. But I mean, if you look at the co-working space, I mean, co-working space, you know, people might remember a generation ago, an amenity for an office building was a common meeting room. And it was always a space we couldn't lease to anybody else. Um, and, and of course, you know, that, that had a place. But obviously, co-working space, whether it be WeWork or others, has a far more compelling offering to other tenants in a building where they can use that for uh, their excess needs, project needs, and so on. Um, and also creates a, a different spin. And, you know, we've... Uh, done a large deal with WeWork in Scotia Plaza, uh, and it's all part of uh, positioning Scotia Plaza on the innovation agenda. So, Emory, you, you almost created an asset class with, with, when you bought the Sable portfolio and, and you've grown it out since then. So this would seem to be meat and drink for you. This would seem to be a logical place. How much of, have you embraced this, or do you not have enough space to even accommodate that with the growth that you have and the tenants that you have? No, we, we've embraced it for some time. We simply haven't dealt with this particular co-working organization, but we've dealt with others. Uh, Spaces has been in our building at 500, 522 King West for about eight years now. They've done extraordinarily well there. Um, and they do, I believe, contribute to an office ecosystem. So to my way of thinking, the presence of co-working uh, in a city like ours um, actually contributes to and speaks to the strength of the office ecosystem. And I also believe they contribute to a building, um, provided they don't represent too large a component uh, of the building. Although we have one building, 180 John, which is occupied entirely by spaces and where they're killing it. And, and I think as I say, from our perspective, they're incubating tenants for us. The one thing I don't agree with is that the co-working enterprises have somehow imagined using space differently. Our tenants, going back almost to 98, are the ones who actually imagined the kind of space people want today and the kind of space people need today in order to compete for talent successfully. Um, what we work and others have done, and it's, it's been very well done, is they've created a flexible regime for enterprises that are at very early stages of their evolution and need incredible flexibility. But the actual space itself um, is really built on open planning, air, and other things that um, Really, the tech sector, among others, has been working very hard on for well over two decades now and has been progressing. So the users have been driving this, not the providers. The providers who are doing well have listened um, and have provided space, and WeWork clearly listened and Space has clearly listened, provided the same kind of space, but on a much more flexible transaction basis. And there's great demand for it. So, John, I know you're keen on innovation, and I know that you've embraced it for a long time now. Um, and I know you've been a supporter of George's in, in what he's trying to do. How do you not become a victim, if I can put it that way? How do you 
uh, as they were saying, how do you not resist the change? How do you embrace the change inside an organization versus as an industry? Is the way to embrace it to look at someone like RealPack and say, go and try and embrace this on our, on our collective behalves, and then we can start to see if we can adopt some of these things? Or do you try and do it company by company and, and rely on the DNA of that company to actually bring that change into one organization versus the industry? You know, well, <laughs> I mean, I'd probably say, there, you know, there's no master strategy or single agenda other than I'd like to think that, um, you know, we're uh, evolving and thinking forward all the time and we're experimenting in a variety of different ways and it's not one exclusive channel. Um, in to St. Thomas, we adopted a variety of our apartment building in Yorkville. We adopted a variety of new te technologies that we've tried out, and most of which I think have been, you know, well received. We have uh, made a number of uh, prop tech investments uh, in funds and in individual entities, where we are looking to be either a incubator customer or a scale up customer, um, <clears throat> and so allow those emerging technologies and companies to work with our guys. Um, and, you know, some of which will work, some of which won't. Um, but we're trying to just learn and absorb and see what's out there. Um, the fact is that I think uh, I'm probably not as radical a thinker as, um, as our previous speakers were. But, I, you know, I think that, that for sure, successful built form will evolve. And, and you know, we want to be in that stream. And it's all the way from energy management and to, th to, to things that we're most focused on, which is how do we make the customer experience better, sticky, what, what is our edge with the customer where they say, you know, that made a difference for them. So um, I, I think I'd like to think our whole organization is energized around the same idea that trying things that are a little bit different, a little bit better um, is, is a good thing. And there's a variety of ways to do that. But do you find this, you know, they were talking, we're talking about the immune system pushing back. Do you find that there is a natural conservatism? No, inside? I don't find that at all. And, you, you know, I think you only have, you only have pushback if, there, if, if, if failure has a penalty. The fact is that if, if failure can be celebrated, people will try things. And, you know, I failed enough that I, I think failure is a good thing. So, um, you know, it is, it's a cultural approach. Uh, and I think that... Um, we try lots of things that don't work as well as they could, and, but that's not, I'd rather have somebody try something and fail than sit on, the, sit on the sidelines. Well, Mr. Cooper, you're the poster child for trying stuff out. Or trying and failed. <laughs> that too. Well, but you, I noticed when Salim was asking the question, how many people have, how many, your hand went up virtually every time for, I know this, I know this, I know this. So you clearly follow it. How do you integrate Michael's just it? fidgety. <laughs> Jump ball. <laughs> um, we've done about $2 billion worth of renewable power, <clears throat> and um, it's been very successful, but it's so focused on what governments do. Um, recently, all the, winning the winners of all the contracts are getting their money in Germany, and they're, they're, they're hedging out 1% debt for 20 years, and you know, we started at 83 cents a kilowatt. It's gone down to three and a half cents now. Um, to the extent that we don't really see a place for ourselves. Um, we started, a, we, we, the, you know, prop tech is interesting. It's, it's venture capital with a subject specific area. So we went together with one of the leaders in Canada in venture capital. And we, we've set up something where on their spectrum of venture capital, anything that falls into the real estate bucket, we put it into a, a corporation that we started and we did it that way because um, there's no promotes, there's no fees. We want to invest in things. We want to be very involved with the companies and help them grow. And then we want to try to raise more money at higher prices so those companies are successful. But we want to make it as frictionless uh, cost-wise for new investors because we want to share as much and grow it as quick as we can. And that, uh, our, our partner who looks at a lot of venture capital is totally blown away about the depth of opportunities and the scale of what our business is in, in, in terms of capital or users or anything compared to the other stuff they do, they can't believe that real estate is so far behind and uh, all of a sudden everybody's turned to see how we can do it better. So we're participating in as many of the deals as we can. We've done one, which is an app. As contrarians, we like parking a lot. We just did one where um, um, after you make a dinner reservation, you can then arrange a parking spot. 
And it's sort of black labeled or white labeled so that it's, it's not what the customer sees. But it's a little bit like Uber where you can make all your arrangements. So if you go on Air Canada, Air, sorry, Air uh, Scotia, but if you go to the former Air Canada <laughs> Center uh, and you book tickets, you can also book a parking spot. And it can be in areas around and you're going to be able to say, uh, um, I want the closest, I want the cheapest. And uh, I think it's going to increase revenues from uh, parking a lot. And it's going to make people's lives a lot better because they won't have to gamble every time. Can I find a spot closer or less expensive? They'll just know. And it'll be another thing that's going to be really good for the consumer. So we love looking at these things. It's really good for everybody because they get to stretch their brain. We, we've got 1,000 people that work for us. They're all getting calls now and saying, can you take a look at this thing that's going to measure something in your HVAC? Or we call somebody else about leasing. Like, they love it because they're looking at the best technology ideas in the world. They're getting smarter, and, and, and we've invested money. I think we'll do well, but there's no doubt that our organization will be much more connected with what's going on. So I think it's a complete win. So, Blair, your office retail, two big streams, both have this potential for change to radically alter what goes inside the built form. Have you partnered with tenants, or what, are you, what is it? And you, you're over in Germany as well, right? So you sort of see things from outside. You're in the U.S., how is your, your, your experience from other places factoring into how you're approaching? And then how in general are you approaching this whole sort of technology side? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I was just listening to these, these three guys talk and the business they built. And when Salim showed how with his video and he put the thing on his head and the summary of his, his, his Purcell, what they thought was belief. And I, I look at what these guys have built and I think whenever I've been on the other side or whenever I see them, they believe in themselves and they believe in their team. And I think because they're willing to fail and they're willing to pivot and they're willing, they want to win. And I think that's unique. And so when we went to the US or we go to Germany, we have that belief and it's still about customer service. It's about, we try and do things others are not doing and where capital's not flowing. When we went to Calgary, that's how we feel about it. When we went to Germany, that's how we feel about it. And we, we focus on fundamental basis buying. What are we buying per square foot? As it relates to technology and, and, and new um, ideas, our average age of our company is 30 years old. Um, you know, I, I think that I look at diversity, and on this panel we have two Michaels and two Johns and a Blair, <laughs> and we're not that diverse. I and come I, from Central Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I think, I think that you have to... I, I come from Alberta. <laughs> so as, as, <laughs> so, so as, I, as I look at it, I think you need to be young and you need to decentralize the thoughts to allow creativity to come in to your own organization. And I also think what's helped us is that what a German tenant might want or a French investor or a European... Like, we try and bring all that into the decision-making and come up with ideas to be proactive and... and and not reactive, but proactive on how we can do things better. I, I think the real estate strategy, I mean, I know I'm in real estate because I couldn't do the tech stuff for finance. I mean, real estate's not, <laughs> it's not the hard part. It's, it's actually the people and the new ideas and trying to put that together that I think we try and focus on. So, so I, I'm just going to, if I might, just push back a titch and say, you know, innovation is not uh, the domain of the young. It's the domain of the curious. And the most important thing that, that, that people have to do, and it requires leadership, and this would be everybody at this table, is you have to, have, you have to fundamentally be curious. Um, because in, unless you're curious and trying things and so on and so forth, uh, you'll never want to innovate. And uh, because you've got to have that core gene. So think about that. I'd like to pick up on John's point because I think one of the biggest uh, changes we're dealing with, uh, and I think it's systemic in the industry, is... Um, the whole notion of what leadership is in real estate is changing very, very quickly. And what we're looking for, for um, people to contribute to the company is completely different from what it used to be. John, I think what you're saying is it's not age-based, and I think that's true. I, I have a bit of a bias. <laughs> well, we're on the seniors panel. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, I think for all you millennials who think you're the shit, uh, <laughs> that started in 1980. You're 38 years old. I hope you've accomplished almost all of what you want to do because the generation behind you is awesome. They are so good, they're turning like 23, 24. A lot of them graduate from school. Everybody's getting more aggressive. I heard a story about Goldman Sachs that now when they're hiring people, private equity guys are giving them bids to hire them two years later. You can get a job at Goldman Sachs and you can have your exit 24 months out. That's the kind of competition for the people that are coming out of school ready to go. So I think that um, there's so much talk about millennials, but their time, they're, they're sort of getting their own way through this whole thing and there's a bunch of people coming. And I think you've got to find the best people of any generation. 
um, and, and, and to try to put a team together. And, you know, what we keep working on and trying to get right is, you know, if you're leading people, what are you supposed to do? And it's not going to be measured in terms of cost of leasing per square foot or how you're doing CapEx. It's going to be much more aspirational to get people juiced and empowered. And we struggle with it because we, if we could take as many people and as much money as we're spending on compliance and accounting and put it into technology, um, we'd probably be by far the biggest spenders on real estate technology in the country. So we're trying to figure out how to you know, do the absolute minimum there, take the money and put it into things that will move it. And having leadership that um, really does inspire. Well, Mr. Emery, you, you, you live in a similar regime of, uh, of lots of money for compliance and governance and all of those good things. But you must be driven. I mean, you've got the laboratory with the, that tenant base that you have. You have a window that's probably unparalleled for anybody else in the industry in terms of just the tenants you have in there. What are the lessons, what is it that you're seeing that's coming out of there that, that's really pertinent to your organization and then how it sort of spreads to, to the bigger audience? Yeah, I, I would summarize it as a sort of humanism. Um, if I look at the users of our space today and going back 20 years, there's been a progression towards more humanistic environments where people actually could interact more productively, more creatively, uh, with more genuine enthusiasm than is achievable in some of the more compartmentalized, regimented, and formalized environments. So I do agree with your comment. We have a phenomenal guide and have had a phenomenal guide uh, ever since we started serving the knowledge-based industry in the late 90s forward. And we've taken the opportunity to learn everything we can from them uh, because, as, as John points out, uh, even though we're old, or I am at least, and even though Allied is in some respects a one-trick pony, it only does one thing, it, does it reasonably well. Uh, but we've been able to learn an incredible amount and incorporate that, hopefully successfully over time, uh, into what we're providing back. Uh, we learned from them, for example, that amenity-rich neighborhoods have incredible appeal. That doesn't mean that environments that are a little less amenity-rich have become obsolete or have become redundant, uh, but that's a factor that people strive for and will attribute value to. Open plan, it's almost a truism now. Um, if you can't provide a flexible open environment, which allows more efficiency as well as more interaction, you're done. You're, you're out of the game. Air, light, it goes on and on. It all comes from what you very properly describe as a laboratory, and I think all I know is office with any, you know, with any degree of depth. But I think the same is true in most other segments uh, of our business. And the users are telling us what to do. And in the case of the office world, the users are trying to create an environment that will allow them to compete successfully for talent, full stop. And if you can help them do that, you're going to win. And if you can't, you're going to lose. And that's something I think all four of you share is this, this this drive for talent is really the, I mean, HR people have been talking about it for years, but that's really what's driving everything now, right? It's just Yeah. Montreal has become a surprising success story in the eyes of many Canadians. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise at all. They're creating or generating growing pools of talent in that city, and the men and women who comprise that talent pool want to stay there. And so the employers are coming to capture them. Uh, it's not because they love Montreal all of a sudden. It's because there's this huge talent pool. We have a lot of space in Kitchener. For Allied, it's the last place in the world we should be. But the University of Waterloo is there. And these talented young men and women are coming out in droves, and Google is there, among <coughs> others, to capture them. It's that simple. So um, we only have two minutes, and I have to read a certain number of announcements to pay the bills. Um, we could go They've on. They've been paid a lot. What's that? 
bills have been paid. There you go. <laughs> um, but we, I know we could go, we didn't even touch autonomous vehicles because we never would have gotten there and there's no point starting something you can't finish. Um, but I would like to do two things. Number one, thank the four panelists there. Collective real estate IQ is massive and more to the point, they are innovators. And so the filter that they're putting this through, I think is valid for all of us. So on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention and your energy. Thank you very much.